Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to all of you to the University of Chicago Center in Delhi. Uh, it's great to see all of you here. My name is Bharat. I'm the executive director of the center. Uh, the center itself was set up uh, a little under a year ago now, just about 11 months ago. Uh, so this is actually the start of sort of a celebratory month for us because it is our anniversary month. And we have a bunch of really great programming that's going on. Uh, and I think it's great to kick off this uh, anniversary month with such a wonderful panel here today to talk about a, a topic that's extremely um, important to the, to, to the country and to the economy um, of this Make in India campaign that the new government has launched several months ago now. The, the purpose with which the center was set up was to promote and enhance the amount of research that the University of Chicago does on India. And that research is extremely wide ranging. It covers topics all the way from the humanities to um, issues around the economy to issues relating to healthcare and so on. And you'll see that reflected in the, in the programming that we have on at the center across this month. Uh, you'll see that in the, in the giant screen uh, back there. And hopefully many of you will be able to make it back for uh, several of those events that are going on. But in addition to the research, one of the, one of the interesting things that, that we've been doing uh, here in India since the center set, was, was set up uh, is this fellowship program that we call the International Innovation Corps, or the IIC. Uh, and that's the program from which this program this evening comes to you from. Uh, it's a program that we launched to work with uh, various Indian government officials and bureaucrats that have really interesting big ideas, but that often might lack uh, the, the, the human resources that they need to actually push those ideas through. And when we were speaking about this program with Mr. Kant, he was one of the early supporters of it in his role then as the leader of the Delhi Mumbai Industrial Development Corporation, the DMICDC. Uh, he certainly saw the potential of the program and jumped at the opportunity to work with an IIC team on pushing that program further. And that's a program he's ended up supporting as well in his new role as the secretary of the DIPP. Um, and interestingly, many of the programs that we launched as part of the International Innovation Corps ended up, I think, focusing on this theme of Make in India. So the Delhi Mumbai Industrial Development Corporation, a team with the NSDC, which is certainly a critical element of the Make in India campaign as well, uh, and one that works with the Central Electronics Limited uh, on uh, an issue of sort of enhancing the amount of solar energy uh, that we produce in India. Again, a, a critical element of designing some of these new cities that will be part of the Make in India campaign. So it's a great event to, to kickstart our anniversary month. Uh, and it's great to have an alum moderating today's discussion. Many of you will know Louis Miranda, who is an alum of the Booth School of Business, a great friend and supporter of the, of the Delhi Center. Uh, and among his many accomplishments are the fact that he was on the founding team of HDFC Bank and of IDFC's private equity arm in India. And um, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Louis to uh, begin this evening's program. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bharat. Can you guys hear at the back? OK, good. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. It's been nine months since the Prime Minister Modi announced the plans for his grand vision for manufacturing in India, uh, <coughs> make in India. Uh, and it really consisted of six pillars. <coughs> One is to boost manufacturing. Second is to encourage innovation. Third is to attract investments. Fourth is to cut red tape. Fifth was to create jobs. And finally, to turbocharge the economy. And uh, after nine months, I think it's great that we're over here together to take stock of what's happening. Uh, <clears throat> we've, uh, this is the day after the budget. You got this lovely sort of thing about the line is all over the place uh, over here. And uh, it's sort of uh, created an excitement over here in India about manufacturing. So at the same time, you open today's paper and the CEO of Vodafone talks about how it's challenging and difficult to in operate in India. HSBC in their uh, report on, product, on production management talks about the fact that we're at a five-month low in terms of manufacturing. So it'll be interesting over here because we've got two great people involved in this. One is Amitabh Kant, who sort of is the, is the face for the Make in India program from the government side and uh, was earlier sort of instrumental in bringing out the DMICDC. And before that was also very famous for creating Kerala as a tourism destination. And Adil sort of um, is the chairman of the Quality Commission and, uh, and therefore brings a very interesting perspective because I was, some of you have sent in your questions and a lot of them relate also to quality, the quality concerns we have in Indian manufacturing. And uh, before that Adil was uh, <coughs> the head of McKinsey in India, and uh, his, other, his, his connection also to Chicago, besides being on the Global Advisory Board of Chicago Booth, all four sons of his went to the college at Chicago. So he spent actually more 
money at the University of Chicago and then at Harvard University. <coughs> but you guys from the International Investment Co. And uh, uh, <coughs> you know, we've got three projects of ISC and all are really connected with the Make in India program. Uh, project. Uh, you guys have been working for seven months. All the guys wearing t-shirts are the ones connected with the other fellows over here. <coughs> We've got three sort of projects. One is with DMICDC working on smart cities. Can you guys who are involved in that project stand up? Okay. So these are the smart guys working on this project. Thank you. Uh, the next is NSDC working on skilling. Okay. Thank you. And then the third is CL working on indigenous production for the solar industry. Again, I got to tell you guys a story. I mean, not a story, but I, I'm going to read, read out an email that one of my colleagues sent me. Uh, I'm sitting in a workshop for the Delhi Mumbai corridor. And the guys who've done a lot of work, a lot of the groundwork for this, are those bright young folks, many of whom are Chicago grads. This seems to be some kind of Fulbright kind of thing because they are all recent graduates. Great to see most of them aren't even Indian, but are working on the DMIC. I think that's a great endorsement for the support you've been giving this program. And um, I'm going to shut up now. I'm going to pass it on to Amitabh Khan to talk about what making the genesis for this is, and then pass it on to Adil to talk about what they're trying to do also in a couple of specific areas with Make in India. And then we're going to have just throw it open to you guys for questions. Uh, thanks, Louis. Uh, you know, the key challenge for India really is to grow at rapid rates of uh, 9 to 10 percent per annum year after year, year after year for three decades or more to be able to lift a very vast segment of our population, which is uh, very young. Uh, India has grown essentially on the back of the services sector almost 60 percent of our GDP comes on the back of services. The manufacturing sector stagnated around 16 percent. No country in the world post World War II has grown without a strong manufacturing base. Japan, Korea, China, you need, especially a country with a population of 1.2 billion, you need manufacturing to drive growth to drive job creation. I think the genesis is, is this, really, to drive manufacturing so that manufacturing can grow to about 25 percent of GDP, create 100 million jobs. Uh, that's essential. Uh, now, there are very, very many challenges in this, uh, several reasons. One is that we've made India a very complex, very complicated, very difficult place to do business. I think all of us across states, across center, made things very, very difficult for people to do business. And therefore, it's very important that, uh, which is what we've tried to do, is to scrap a number of rules, regulation, procedures, paperwork, act, regulation, uh, so that we make things simpler, easier for people to get on to do work. That's number one. Number two, uh, how do we use technology to converge and integrate various government departments in, uh, across central government, across state government, across municipality, use technology to converge and leapfrog. And that is what we are trying to do in partnership with Microsoft to create the eBiz platform. It's still at its initial stages of converging 14 Government of India services. But over a long period of time, all the state, central, municipal services will get integrated along with this. So the challenge is that we need to improve on ease of doing business, not for World Bank's sake, but for India's sake. And for India's sake, India must become a very, very easy place to do business. That, to my mind, is how you can sustain growth over a long period of time. I think the second thing that we've tried to do is to really push the envelope on foreign direct investment. We've opened up a vast range of new areas of growth. We've opened up uh, the railway sector to 100% FDI investment, which was quite unimaginable some time back. We've opened up construction to 100% FDI, easy rules of entry and exit now. We've opened up uh, insurance. We've opened up defense, which was quite a closed sector which is, to my mind, is a very early flower to be plucked. We've opened up medical devices. And other than multi-brand retail, 
uh, India to my mind is one of the most liberal places for foreign direct investment across the world. And almost 90% of the FDI in India comes through the automatic route. Only 10% comes through a government approval process of the FIPB. So we've opened up uh, as much as possible on the FDI regime. And if any one of you has suggestion to open up more, we'll be very happy to accept that and push the envelope even further. I think the third thing, to my mind, which is very critical is that India needs essentially uh, to create a number of young innovators. India needs to create a large scale spirit of young enterprise. Uh, we have essentially become a country of job seekers. We need to convert that into job creators, as the FM said in his budget speech, and that would require creating a completely new ecosystem. Many of these issues of startups, of venture funds, of entrepreneurship, we've tried to address in this new budget by providing a pass through for venture funds, for creating a new organization called SETU, which will assist and support, which will provide mentorship. And to my mind, uh, the way forward is really to push the envelope uh, as far as young enterprise is concerned. Uh, the fourth is critical, which to my mind is that much of this will happen if we can think in terms of size and scale. Uh, India has done quite well in terms of uh, their unique examples of manufacturing in India. I met this very young person at the aero show called Udyant Malhotra, who actually uh, does manufacturing for, uh, he's just collaborated. In fact, the PM spoke about his company called Dynamatic uh, Engineering, which has collaborated with Boeing. But now he's doing the entire cabin for Bell helicopters. He, in another company, he supplies material to Mercedes, BMW, Volkswagen. I mean, they're unique entrepreneurs in India who've done some remarkable piece of work, young entrepreneurs. I mean, these are amazing young people who've done work. And uh, we need to enhance the size and scale of manufacturing in India. We need to push that in a very big way. And I think uh, some of these, this is a function of big infrastructure projects as well. And to my mind, infrastructure uh, we need to push that in a very, very big way. And uh, unless and until we are not able to uh, create good quality world infrastructure in terms of manufacturing, that is creating large scale industrial cities where you have plug and play facilities, have electricity, have water, power available to entrepreneurs to get in, start doing manufacturing and push. So to my mind, uh, broadly this, but the, it's important to understand that uh, as in India, India is a unique case where there is a lot of good frugal innovation is taking place. India has become an extremely important place for large companies because this is, this is a country where uh, United Technologies shifted its manufacturing from Japan, Mitsubishi to India to Tata's to do it so that they could manufacture the entire uh, US to plane which they manufacture. The entire cabins are made here. Or uh, if you look at Procter & Gamble, uh, their Gillette uh, Braze, uh, razor and uh, several of their products they've done here simply because India provides a unique model of frugal innovation. Uh, and that, to my mind, again provides a, a unique ecosystem of doing uh, some amazing things in India. Uh, and as uh, we drive manufacturing, I'm quite confident as we improve ease of doing business, as we build up our infrastructure, as we get into uh, pushing the envelope on innovation, you will see India growing and expanding on manufacturing and creating jobs. But it's important to understand that India is to operate at several levels. Uh, India will have to push advanced manufacturing. Uh, several states like Gujarat, Maharash will push the envelope in advanced manufacturing, but at the same time, it's important to understand that the labor intensity of labor intensity of manufacturing in India is falling very sharply. And because labor intensity of manufacturing is falling, you can't have growth without jobs. You'll also have to focus on sectors like textiles, leather, uh, food processing, uh, gems and jewelry, which will create large scale jobs in India. So these are a few points which I want to make. Thank you. Adil, you want to elaborate more? Talk about some of the, on, the, on the job part and the quality. Sure. It's, uh, and how you fit in also with Make in India. Well. <clears throat> Uh, as the Prime Minister said, and as Amitabh said, if you make goods and services that nobody wants, and you make them of poor quality at very high prices, you haven't solved the problem. 
So we have to make goods and services in India that are of very high quality. So I call it make in India with quality. Okay. That's the that's how this fits in together. And while there are many aspects of quality that we can talk about, I just like to highlight that in certain areas, uh, as Amitabh mentioned, we have achieved some incredible levels of quality. For example, cars and two wheelers that are made in India are now exported all over the world and we have achieved Six Sigma quality in many of those. Okay. Uh, we have, we produce some of the 30% uh, of generic drugs in the US are actually supplied out of India. It has an industry that has grown dramatically. Uh, and so there are many individual examples of very high quality products that are made in India. But that accounts for a very small proportion of products that are made in India. We also have outstanding services that are made in India. Our IT services sector is better than almost any other in the world and that's why we export $60 billion worth of services. But a large proportion of services in India, in fact, don't have that quality. You know, if you look at healthcare services, the quality is not where we would like. If you look at educational services, the quality is not where we would like. Uh, some people would argue that telecom services, while they're extraordinarily cheap and have hit every part of the country, are not of the quality that we'd like. So the idea is to improve the quality of all goods and services in the interest of both exports as well as improving the lifestyle of people in India. So it, I think it fits in very well. I'd like to just highlight two aspects of quality that the Quality Council is working on. So I'll start out by saying the Quality Council was set up in the late 90s and the idea was to promote quality in goods and services, which is a task that's about this big. Uh, today, Quality Council does about this, uh, which is great because it went from zero to there, and so there are many services that have good quality. The goal is to get it from here to here and then ultimately to here. So in the interest of doing that, there are two big programs that we are going to start out in which link with uh, Make in India. Most of the jobs, Amitabh talked about job creation. Everywhere in the world that we've seen, job creation comes from small enterprises. Small and medium-sized enterprises, as they go from 10 to 100, 100 to 1,000, those are the folks who create jobs. Uh, large-scale uh, chemical plants, large-scale steel plants, large-scale aluminum refineries, and large-scale car factories are very highly automated, and they don't create that many jobs. A new textile um, uh, garment producer can add 30,000 jobs. Okay. A leather uh, reasonable, you know, a collection of uh, leather, a leather cooperative uh, that creates uh, wonderful products made out of leather can add 50, 100,000 jobs. Okay. So all of the, a lot of the job creation is going to come from small and medium-sized enterprises. When we look at small and medium-sized enterprises, the level of quality in small and medium enterprises, their understanding of quality and the quality of the goods coming out of that are nowhere near what some of these high points that I described. So when we talk to many of the best two-wheeler manufacturers in India, they will say, We've achieved this level of quality. Our tier one suppliers have achieved this level, which is great. And our tier two and tier three suppliers and the suppliers to them are at a very basic level and we need to improve their quality. Today in India, there are 35 million SMEs. Okay? Uh, and today, Quality Council, working with uh, all of the industry association, is helping 6,000 of them get better. At that rate, it will take us uh, you know, several thousand years before we get to where we'd like to on quality. So our goal is to try and expand that and get to improve quality at a million SMEs in the next few years. Okay. It's a huge step and cannot be done without technology and it cannot be done without thinking about uh, it in a completely different way than we have thought about before. Uh, and that's our goal. And if we can do that, it fundamentally improves the quality of uh, products and services in India. Let me give you one example just to show how urgent this is. Uh, today, India supplies uh, almost 50% of the raw leather in the world in terms of exports. India exports 50% of the raw leather. Uh, in terms of finished goods made from that leather, from that leather that we export, uh, we exp only 3% of that leather is converted to finished goods in India because the quality of finished goods in India doesn't match up to what the rest of the world expects. And 30% of the finished leather goods in the world are made in China, much of it from Indian leather. And you know, at some level, this makes no sense. We have to improve the quality of finished leather goods in India and 
make sure that everybody around the world understands that Indian finished goods are of high quality. So we're thinking of how do you create a made in India leather stamp that is, can only be achieved if you achieve world class quality and use that to improve uh, the quality of goods so that more leather is finished, is converted to finished goods in India. If you do that, right off just in leather, you will add several million jobs just in leather to do that. And you know, you go industry by industry and that's how you get to the 100 million. So it's a very, so quality is at the heart of make in India. If you make lousy products, nobody will buy them. So that's what we're trying to do. A million SMEs is still only a small fraction, but hopefully it's all the largest fraction, it's the largest of the small and medium enterprises that we're gonna go to. But if we can get to a million, then in fact that will make a huge difference uh, in terms of the quality in India, and it will create a lot of jobs. So that is one huge effort that we are making. Uh, I think it will be on the same order of magnitude as we're trying to do in Make in India, mobilizing resources and getting things out there. So that's one big step we are taking. The other big step we're taking, which is also linked to Made in India uh, in, in many ways, is the ability to improve the quality quality of government services as delivered to the individual citizen and business. Okay? Uh, if I ask any of you who lives in Delhi or in any city in Bombay, what has been your interaction as a citizen in terms of the quality of government services that you get, it will be pretty bad. Not that there aren't good examples of individual services that are provided. For example, uh, passport services used to be a nightmare. If you had to get a passport, it was horrible. And now that it's been automated, we can track statistics and it works, right? So we can use technology to improve the not just the delivery of services, but then you can track and measure it. So our goal is, can you for individual citizen services and for business lay down standards of what quality we should achieve as a government, central, state, municipal, Zilla Parishad, etc., for services, and then measure it and track it and help them get better. I think anything you can measure and track automatically starts getting better because no elected official wants to go in front of their constituents and say, uh, this year all the services we failed 99% of the time. I mean, you know, that's not a very good way to go back. So we are hoping that we can construct uh, a series of measurements for both citizen services and services to business that would establish standards, then measure whether we're hitting those standards. So that's how quality, uh, that's what we're doing in quality, and that's how it links in very tightly with the mission of uh, Made in India. I just wanted to add on to what Arjun said, that uh, Make in India is not about protectionism at all. Uh, we are in a globalized world, and uh, uh, you need to excel. And unless and until India is not a part and Indian companies are not an integral part of the global supply chain, you can never penetrate global markets. And for that to do, the quality standards are very, very critical. And therefore, essentially, the objective is that drive Indian companies to become a part of uh, global supply chains. Thank you. Uh, we've got till about 6.30. Uh, so, uh, but, but before I carry on, I want to just say that the, the brainchild of these t-shirts actually was Adali. He said, why don't we get t-shirts done? And uh, then Aditi sort of decided that we shall not get one or two or three t-shirts, we'll get a whole lot of t-shirts here. So, uh, uh, and then we had this question someone asked this morning, are the t-shirts made in India? <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. Those who believe it's made in India, put your hands up. Those who believe it's made in Bangladesh, put your hands up. For, for the record, it's made in India. <laughs> okay. Those guys are in the textile. <laughs> Go ahead. There's a question. Are there mics around or what's the. Okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah, okay. You got it. It works? Okay. Uh, so I just. You just talked about something very important measuring the way that you provide government services. And about how, for example, with the recent developments of the Right to Information Act, for example, that makes it a lot more effective because all of a sudden you have all this information coming out. Yet, there's a, there's a small step that's missing, right? 
I mean, so for example, um, there's a group of researchers here in Delhi that are working on environmental clearances right now. And so they're trying to use the data that came out out of right, uh, right to Information Act to track how these environmental clearances have going on and to test different hypotheses as to why it takes so long and why so many people are approved, okay? But the problem is the data is, is released in a format that is not friendly at all to do these kinds of analysis. The format in which, so you can have a law that says you have to release information, but then the agency that releases that information doesn't have to release it in a format or in a way that can actually be used to measure in an effective way. And so I was wondering if you had an idea of how that's going to evolve. I mean, is, it, is there a possibility that there be a new interpretation of the Rights to Information Act and we could perhaps better use that information? Or, I mean, how, how do you see that evolving? <laughs> I'll talk about all other services. No, no, that's a, that's a tough one. And uh, it's a very important point uh, that is being made. And uh, it's important that uh, we standardize certain things so that uh, we are able to get information in a far better manner and which is capable of good analysis. Uh, and uh, we are able to examine and analyze how government departments are working. And uh, to my mind, uh, what has happened uh, is that uh, there's, been a, there's been a particular kind of a mindset. And I've been working on ease of doing business uh, for the last couple of months with government departments. And I find a very frozen mindset of different departments. They believe in working in silos. And uh, they, f they believe that what they're doing is the right way to do it. And it's, uh, th it's very difficult to convince them that you need to integrate and converge with other departments. It's also very difficult to tell them that you can scrap this process. Actually, this is totally irrelevant. It's, uh, but we've, we've managed to do this. We've managed to do this across different departments. We've managed to converge 14 different departments over the last three to four months, which is, to my mind, one big achievement in Government of India to be able to uh, technologically converge them and eventually try and converge all services of state municipalities, Zilla Parishads on one platform. But uh, I'll be very happy on the environmental side if, uh, uh, if, we can, if you can give me some inputs. I'll be ha very happy to take it up with the Secretary Environment to say that this is, this is uh, it's necessary to put it in this standardized manner so that uh, uh, young students from Chicago can analyze, examine you and assess your performance. Yeah, yeah, I'll be very happy yeah. to do that. So let me, uh, I, I have, uh, I just wanted to add to that, which is, look, it's not a simple uh, solution, right? It's a, it's a very complicated thing to do. But here's one of the aspects of quality that uh, I've now come to believe in, which is by and large, whenever the government sets the standard, right? And it's a mandatory standard, typically that sets the minimum bar for quality. The maximum bar for quality is always set by voluntary standards because people believe that's a good thing to do and that their customers, in this case the citizens or businesses, want something better, right? So by and large what the Quality Council is trying to do is to convince different industries, different departments and others that it is in their interest to have a very high standard for quality, not a mandated standard for quality. Now think about this, right? When you go buy a car, do you look and say, does this meet quality standards, not emission standards? Right. Nobody looks at, you know, whether there are some countries have a quality standard for cars and nobody cares because the actual standards that companies deal with in the marketplace are much higher. Okay. So if you can turn it around, right, we always come and say, why can't the government do this, right? Let's turn it around. So what we're trying to do is, and in fact, we are finding a lot of openings on this, right, which is if you can get one state or one city or one government department to fundamentally say, look, I don't care what Amitabh says in terms of setting standards. This is, you know, it saves me a lot of time, energy, and everything, and we're going to give us uh, your help in measuring this and publishing it and do it electronically, because then it's a lot easier to measure, right? Paper stuff is very difficult to measure, electronics is so What happens is if you get one city to do it, or one state to do it, or one department to do it, then all of a sudden everybody else, the, the demonstration effect is massive, you know? so. Somebody says, I'm about to put a billion dollar plant in, uh, uh, you know, in uh, uh, Maharashtra. And, uh, you know, the, somebody in the state next door says, well, why did you go there? And they go, well, because 
I got these 37 clearances in three days and you guys are taking 12. And they go, wait a second, you know, those, we are much smarter than those guys in Maharashtra. You know, we can do better than that. And I think this little healthy competition, which the FM and the PM talked about, which is not only are we a cooperative federalism, but we are also a competitive federalist state. Okay? And trying to get the states and the cities to compete with each other a little bit will, I think, you know, have a cascading effect. So rather than force it, see, my view is anytime you force, you'll get minimum standards. I'll say, okay, if you absolutely insist, fine, what's the minimum I have to do? Let's just do that, right? What we want people to do is to say, we are going to stretch for maximum quality, not for minimum quality. Of course, it takes time, right? And I think in maximum quality, everybody will find, I mean, it's an old corporate trick, right? If you don't want anyone to judge your performance, what do you do? You change formats, right? You say, well, last year was like this, this year was like this. You change something else. You say, well, you know, I've changed the organization, so you can't measure because this year it has these three departments, next year, last year it had seven. And by the way, you know, government bureaucrats are as smart, if not smarter, than corporations do. So if you want to obfuscate, you can always obfuscate. What you want to do is change it so that people want to get to better quality because it is, they view it as a part of what they're doing and they see the real benefit in doing it then many of these go away. Now, is it easy to do? Of course not. Absolutely not. So you're absolutely right about this. But I'd rather get to the point where we have people with strong leadership in certain institutions who say, I will do this, and I want to drive it in my area, and then let everybody else look at that and say, why should I be left out? Uh, that, that's Anyway, our strategy on quality is government standard, minimum quality, Voluntary standards, maximum quality. So I, I just give you the example, you know, when um, I was driving, um, I was Secretary of Tourism in Kerala, and one of our major concerns was that the backwaters of Kerala, which are extremely unique, uh, should be environmentally very sustainable. And the houseboats came in, and uh, we just said, uh, we'll do classification. And we said, this is green standard, you have to have uh, chemical sanitation on board, you have to have uh, renewable energy, uh, you have to have solar energy. We defined the parameters and we suddenly realized that those with green certification were actually getting a far more higher unit value realization. They were getting 8,000 rupees a night other than houseboats which were getting 4,000, 4,500 rupees a night and everybody went in for green uh, certification and it was nothing was compulsory, it was just all voluntary and that really led to a huge movement towards uh, sustainability in the backwaters of Kerala. Uh, the similar thing we are trying to achieve on ease of doing business, we've actually analyzed and examined the 98 per different permissions which are required, we've listed them out, we've sent them down to the state governments and we are just So you ask a question, you get a t-shirt. Those who only got t-shirts don't get a second. Always <laughs> good question. You want quality. No, no, only good question. Yeah, you, say you, want, you want quality. <laughs> you see the, the data on growth in core sectors, which, is, which has been published last year, you know, show that the growth in each of the eight core sectors has been the lowest in the, in the last many months. What explains this? Is it that the push which is being given that lacks force? You can't, uh, you see the program's been launched around September. It's been five, six months. You want, you're talking about structural changes. You're talking about uh, scrapping processes, procedures. It's going to take years. I'm, I'm telling you, you won't get benefits out of what we are trying to do. Uh, we've just done away with the, uh, we've initiated changes in the FDI policy just about three, four months back. Insurance has just happened yesterday. If you expect results to come in in three to four months' time, I mean, you are living in another world, it's going to take you minimum 18 months. You know, the problem in India is that companies are very highly over-leveraged. Uh, banks are over-leveraged, companies are over-leveraged, so it'll take a little while. 
I mean, uh, to my mind, uh, wait for about 18 months. Patience will be a virtue. But once you get onto that cycle of growth, then it will be quite, you will accelerate it. See, also you, we must understand that we are at about 6% uh, GDP per annum, uh, growth per annum, in, uh, you know, we are, and we are accelerating. The world around us is not growing at all. So uh, India in isolation is growing at 6% and accelerating is a pretty good performance to my mind. Um, I have a question about the administrative and bureaucratic framework that makes a mission like Make in India possible. Uh, over the past few years, I mean, you know, whether we have poverty programs or whether we have, you know, four different ministries in energy, the one problem we've noticed is that, is that it's hard for India to have a coordinated strategy in anything because, as you said, you know, ministries and departments of the government are used to working in silos. Given that, what I'm interested in knowing is what is, apart from technology, what is the bureaucratic framework that makes a mission like Make in India possible to, you know, as a mechanism to converge a variety of departments? And what does this portend for future missions and programs that the government were to, you know, implement? Wherever I've worked in government, I've kept, I've always believed that the government must be lean and thin. Keep it to the barest minimum and outsource everything, every single thing. You should have the ability to think through what you want to achieve at the end of the day. Get Never work with a mediocre agency. Always work with the best possible agencies. In terms of the planning in the Delhi-Mumbai corridors, I worked with the best planners from across the world. In terms of the marketing of Kerala, I worked with the best creative agency. I've never in my life ever worked, being a government officer, I've never worked on the lowest cost. I've uh, always worked on quality come cost. I've always tried to work with the West Agency. Even for Make in India, the creative bit is all being done by Weden and Kennedy, which is an outsourced agency. Uh, I've created Invest India, which is hand-holding investors. All young, young boys like you, all young creative lawyers, all hand-holding people uh, from across the world. All the top companies of the world are being hand-holded. They are the ones acting as facilitators and catalysts. I'm paying them market price. I always believe that government should be just a few people. Rest of it, unleash the energy of the young India. How do you get around the L1 problem over there? Well, the government has a very interesting uh, order, which many people don't know, that for major national, cam major national campaigns, you can do uh, uh, what they call as QCB, quality come cost. So I've always tendered out, I've always done it in a transparent, competitive bid process, but I've always put 70 to 80 marks on quality, 20% on pricing, but I always get the right price through that. Yeah. So you had mentioned earlier that um, Year on year, 10% growth is an imperative for India. And my question is, you know, uh, that's the background for my question. Uh, we know that infrastructure needs to be developed for around 450 million Indians by 2050. And the numbers here are staggering. So the water required, the fresh water required, for example, is seven times the Red Sea, or the, the Dead Sea, right? Uh, the amount of land, the amount of waste that will be generated can cover 10 Manhattans 60 meters high. Now for these staggering numbers, I, you know, we are working to create a sustainability roadmap for one of the cities under DMICDC. But uh, since you're also here, we, you know, is it a good idea to have a standard, as Sir was talking about earlier when in Kerala these standards work, for sustainable city development? So if at a national level, any city, you know, like cooperative federal, I mean, co competitive federalism, if any city wants to call itself a sustainable city, it has to adhere to certain not, maybe not prescriptive standards, but at least output-based standards on energy use, water use, uh, landfill ratios, how, and how would we go about building that? So, you know, uh, uh, that's a very important question to my mind, and I think uh, one of the key drivers of India's growth will have to be urbanization. And India has been a very, very reluctant urbanizer uh, over the years, and we'll have to drive the, the opportunity. There's a huge opportunity there uh, because, uh, you know, Cities account for just 3% of the land mass, but they account for 80% of the global GDP. And this is exactly the story which India will go through. Now, India is at a point of time when the process of urbanization has ended across Europe. It's ended across America. It's nearing its completion in China. And India has just begun. And the challenge is that while cities account for 80% of the global GDP, they also account for two-thirds of the greenhouse gas emissions. And therefore, the challenge for India is that how do we create a more innovative and sustainable model of urbanization, which can then become the model for the rest of the world. And that is really the challenge for India. And 
uh, the advantage for India is that it can look around the world and see what are the best examples and many of these examples come from the eastern part of the world and not the western part of the world. You know, when America and Europe urbanized, land, gas and water were all cheaply uh, available and therefore they created sprawling cities. Atlanta, 98.2% of the people travel by car, they guzzle gas, they pollute the world. Uh, you know, when you compare it with Barcelona, 12 times more ecological footprint. So India's challenge is, how do you embed your urbanization with public transportation? How do you recycle your water? How do you recycle your waste? And I think many of these examples are excellent examples are available. Go to Kita Kyushu. Kita Kyushu in Japan was the most polluted city in the world post World War II. In 1970s, it drove the manufacturing of Japan. Power projects, steel projects, everything. But it became the most polluted city of the world. And the women of Kita Kyushu rose in revolt and let the Dokai Bay on which it was based became yellow from blue. And the women of Kita Kyushu led a complete revolution there. It was, they were backed by Methi. Today, everything is recycled there. Go to Yokohama, 40% of the waste is recycled. 41% of the waste is, is they, they reduced waste to an extent of 41%, balance is all recycled. Go to Singapore, great example of water management. So look at the challenge which Singapore faced. I mean, they were ending their treaty with Malaysia, no water, absolutely no water. Rainwater, dual piping, recycling, desalination, every possible thing they do. They recycle every single drop of waste water. What are you talking about India? India is excess water. It's the management of water which has failed us. It's Indians who have failed in the management of water. We, Singapore uses 10% of its waste water as human drinking water. Why shouldn't India do that? Technology makes it possible today. I want to add uh, something on this urbanization, if I might, right? which is we, we will have another 350, 300 million or 350 million people moving into cities. And so, uh, you know, in the past, as you said, we were a reluctant uh, urbanizer, and therefore there was little planning done, and therefore we have what we have. But if we thought about it and actually planned for it before the fact, uh, then I think, in fact, you can put the latest technologies and do all sorts of things. Uh, uh, you know, for example, uh, there is most of the time, most of the Indian cities that exist today, we are putting in a transportation plan after the fact, right? All the buildings are built and then we have to say, oh my God, how are these people going to move? But in the new cities or in the new townships that are being built or in the new suburbs that are being built, you can actually start with the transportation plan first, the water plan first, the recycling plan first. And just as, and so you know, you can think of some very interesting uh, certifications, you can think of some very interesting things that you can do. For example, today, you know, India's builders, those of you who bought apartments in India or office space in India know that uh, no builder in India is doing this out of a sense of national purpose. Right, builders do this because they make lots of money and to the extent that they can do anything uh, that is strictly legal but doesn't really, not in spirit, they will do, right? But even builders today are recognizing that if they have a building that is certified green, right? There's green gold, green platinum, etc. They're getting 10% increases in rents. So not because they believe that it's a wonderful thing to do, but because it economically makes sense for them, they are actually building buildings. So I think it's the same thing, right? Which is, if we can start thinking about uh, creating incentives that allow people to think smartly about water, allow people to think smartly about garbage, allow, and all of that, then in fact we have a chance to actually build better cities, much better cities, because we can leverage the latest technology. So I completely agree with you that in fact we have a shot at doing it, and let's build the standards that allow us to do it better. In terms of, uh, do we, do we, does the government have enough capacity to handle urban planning? Are there enough people around over there, urban planners, and such sort of skill sets over there? Uh, why should government? See, Louis, that's the whole point. I mean, uh, there's another issue of town planners yeah, yeah. being frozen in time and used to the American model of planning. But, uh, you know, in the Delhi Mumbai corridor, I've, uh, I've done the planning of uh, seven of these cities. Each one of them, I, we 
India needs compact densities on the back of public transportation. Each one of them we outsourced and got the best planners. It's a multidisciplinary activity. You get the best consultants from around the world whom you feel like. I mean, you select through a transparent process, you'll get the best. India needs to work with the best expertise from the world. You've got an opportunity to do innovation, you've got an opportunity to do sustainability. Let's not mess up with this. That expertise doesn't exist in government. I think, the, I, I think the point you raised is a very good one. I'm going to give an example, which is, let's say you did an exercise that said, to plan the cities, we need 10,000 planners, just as an arbitrary number, right? The government doesn't have to get 10,000 planners. The government shouldn't have those 10,000 planners. It would, but the government, in, the, in a world of X billion people, with uh, you know, planners all over the world, you can get any number of them at any time and ramp up. And the government doesn't have to do it on its own. It can leverage all capacities that are out there in many fronts. So I worked with AECOM, I worked with CH2M, I worked with Parsons. Let me tell you, all these boys who worked with us were the best. They were all Indians. They were all Indians. They were all from the School of Architecture. They were all from IIT Kharagpur. They were all from IIT Chennai. But they were the best in the world. I'll give you one, uh, one other example of that, if I might, just to. You're talking about new cities. But we, I also want to come back to the fact that we have a very large urban population that is in current cities and current towns. And so at some stage, we have to also think about how do we recraft some of our cities so that they have the same characteristics as you talked about, which is they're based on transportation, et cetera. And dense urban centers have a very hard time rebuilding themselves, right? But I think there are several experiments going on which, if they work, will redo the densest centers of towns in a completely sustainable way. I'll give you one example which I'm involved in. Uh, just so you know, in uh, Bombay, there is an area called Bhindi Bazaar, which was built 100 years ago. Uh, it has, there's a section composed of 200 buildings, out of which 100 have been uh, uh, condemned. Right? People are still living in it, but it's been condemned by the municipal corporation. It's a real nightmare. And the community has gotten together and is redoing that uh, 18 and a half acres, 25,000 people. And the next is when it's finished and it's completely rebuilt. Uh, all infrastructure will be new uh, and it will be a completely green, it will be as green and as sustainable as a brand new city that you would build anywhere else. So it's, it's possible, I think, if we are smart to do that. Okay, where you go? Okay, 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 okay fine, okay, okay. Um, hi, I'm Mahima Kishore from the ISC. I have a background in mergers and acquisitions in the United States, and we've worked a lot with industrial businesses. They definitely want to expand their manufacturing facilities in India, and it's a, we boast a huge market and a fantastic labor force. But one of the concerns that they see frequently is that freight takes simply too long to move through this country simply because the roads are not good enough. We have a crippling legacy infrastructure. So what do you think so is something that can be done about that today? Because infrastructure itself can take decades and decades to fix. So uh, that's a very relevant point. And 78% of India's uh, uh, goods actually move by road rather than by rail. And uh, if you were a producer in the northern part of India and you want to export your products, it will take you 12 to 13 days for goods to reach the ports in the western coast of India. And therefore, the logistic costs are quite high. Uh, so a couple of things. One is that uh, government has, is doing this dedicated freight corridors, which is work under progress. By 2018, the dedicated freight corridor, which is being done by the railways, will be up and running on the the Delhi-Mumbai corridor, which will put goods instead of 13 days in 13 hours. So that's the paradigm shift, 13 days to 13 hours. And the Amritsar-Calcutta corridor, which will connect uh, 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 from uh, Calcutta to Ludhiana, and the Chennai-Bangalore corridor, the Vizag-Bangalore uh, corridor, the Vizag-Chennai corridor, and the Bangalore-Mumbai corridor. So the objective of Government of India is that you develop these transport corridors 
and build up large manufacturing cities which will lead to workers moving into those areas and create new, new generation cities around them. That scale strategy and much of this you'll see unfolding by 2018, 2019. Please. Okay, well, okay, well, okay, you in the front. Go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Very happy. Uh, to, to, <laughs> to, to, the, uh, to your presentation uh, and the others who spoke. But it, uh, as an ex-bureaucrat, I feel compelled to ask you that uh, what is exactly the roadmap uh, that one has for making the Make in India campaign get uh, uh, started um, as soon as possible? Because nine months really have gone by sectors are already identified which can spin off jobs by thousands if not millions so what is the process that the ministry is going to take number number of, it's not that uh, uh, you have to uh, it's, it's not like starting a factory or starting a plant number of things have already started i mean i give you this example of dynamatic uh, this thing and uh, actually he started his work the day after the Make in India program was launched and he made the product for the Boeing and handed it over at the Aero Show uh, in, uh, at, the, at the last defense manufacturing at uh, a fortnight back in uh, the Aero Show. So what we are seeing is a huge energy getting unleashed in several ways. I, I mean, I, I see a huge number of investors coming in on a daily basis and that is why foreign direct investment in India has actually over the last eight months increased by almost 32%. Despite a global slowdown, the FDI in India has increased by 32%. So that's a huge, huge growth. And I see a further momentum and I'm, I'm, I'm not getting into process projects which are presently underway, but I see a huge investment taking place in uh, defense manufacturing with Boeing, with Bell helicopters, with Sukhoi aircraft, many, many things happening. So what I'm saying is that to put up, to plan, to get approvals, put a plant, start manufacturing can't be done in nine months. It's not, it doesn't happen anywhere in the world. But, so, but you need to put the direction right. You need to put, say that India has become an easy place to do business. You need to put the approvals in place. You need to put the FDI policy in place. You need to put the infrastructure in place. If you've done that, then the rest of this is, will automatically happen. Private sector, the strategy is not that government gets into manufacturing, but the private sector will step in. Because in today's world, there is, if India gets it right, there's no other place in the world which offers you this level of demand, this level of skills, this level of ports, and, uh, 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 and a very uh, skilled uh, population. So, but, but if you expect results, and it's not a feasible proposition to say that India will, will become a new, completely new India in six months, seven months time. No, we've got only time for two questions. There's some guy at the back of us. Yeah, Who, who's got the mic? Okay. Who do you want? Do you have another one after this? We got two questions. Okay, who's next after this? You, you decide. You're the okay. boss. Go ahead. This way you're responsible, not me. <laughs> People get upset with you. <laughs> okay, hello, sir. So I wanted to come, come back to this environmental sustainability thing. So I've been uh, tracking th a lot of... Uh, okay, Excuse me, but he's stuck here for a little longer. <laughs> okay, so... so so a recent report came in that said that 13 out of most polluted cities in the world exist are in India right now. So with all this Make in India program that we are going to basically help a lot of industrialization, uh, uh, is it going to happen at the cost of like the environment or like what is the kind of roadmap that the government has that this is the, like the minimum level of uh, like the environment sustainability that each organization has to have because it's like we, ca we could have 10 years of massive growth but after 10 years if we destroy the environment so much that it's irreplaceable it is probably it, it's like a cost benefit analysis after that so just wanted to know an inside view of like what kind of uh, steps are being taken so i think that's a that's an important question and uh, it's important because uh, when india embarks on this process of growth and uh, when more and more people get into the process of urbanization, we should be very clear 
that India has to be a sustainable destination and sustainable place. And that is, that is the reason, uh, we, if you look at the sectors identified, a whole range of sectors have been identified under the Make in India program and most of them are those which are very, very sustainable in nature. And where you, uh, uh, you know, these are all areas where uh, we've not focused on hardcore areas which, which are polluting in nature. And I think to my mind, in most of these areas, very strict controls and checks have already been put in place. The last question over here, I think. Yeah. Uh, my name is Karthik. I'm an IIC fellow with the NSDC. My question is, I appreciate your comment on direction setting with the Make in India campaign. My question is, are we looking to develop like the other Asian economies through a virtuous cycle of export savings and investment, especially in the labor intensive manufacturing sectors, which may not have the same impact because the world economy is slowing? Or are we looking at high quality manufacturing, which involves a lot more automation and use of technology, but might not employ as many people. I feel like there's a tension here which needs to be resolved. Let me, let me tell you that there is absolutely no tension, first of all, because, you know, India is a very large country. You can't compare it with any of the Asian countries, number one. Number two, uh, India will have several models of growth. States will have different models. I mean, you will have Gujarat in one area of growth, Maharashtra in another area of growth. Uh, you will see Kerala emerging as a tourism champion, Andhra doing textiles or whatever, uh, uh, Karnatak, uh, Karnatak uh, and Andhra doing labor intensive manufacturing. So, different states will emerge in different areas. But I think why, where India differs from the rest of Asia is simply that it has a very young population. It has a young population, it has, if 72% of your population is below the age of 32, you are going through a window of demographic transition, which rarely ever happens in history. Secondly, you have 950 million telephones, you are adding 9 million telephones a month. So, you I think in India, in many ways, the younger generation will skip a brick and mortar approach and use mobile telephony to drive growth. And it will be in many ways a growth which will enable India to script the brick and mortar marketing, uh, uh, retail marketing and get into e-commerce. And that, these are areas which we are seeing before our eyes. I mean, you are seeing the Flipkart of the world, you are seeing the Snap deal of the world, they are taking on the Amazons of the world. These are all young Indians before your eyes. So, India will adopt a totally innovative, a very different strategy of growth. Don't compare it with Asia, don't compare it with Europe, don't compare it with America. It will be the Indian strategy of growth, fueled by a very young population. Okay, we've got time for one last question. You gentlemen in the right tie. Okay, yes, Pastor. Well, I come from a defense background and uh, I just moved out of the Navy as a Commodore after 33 years of service and now I'm uh, a consultant. I'm extremely happy to see Mr. Khan so passionate and so energetic. I wish uh, it gets emulated by many of your colleagues in different departments. Yes. Uh, uh, just because just, just before I left, you know, uh, just before I left, I was principal director of indigenization, you know, pushing forward the self-reliance agenda of the Indian Navy. Uh, there are a large number of processes uh, which are still uh, in place. There has been no, not much of a changes. Many of them improvements suggested by yours truly. But it's not seeing the day of the light because, and that is what is killing the innovation as well as uh, many other aspects which can drive the growth in the defense, which is most essentially required. Um, you are aware of the import bills and things like that. Eh? India will be one of the biggest, uh, uh, India is actually going to emerge as one of the, it is truly the one of the biggest importers and the challenge for India is uh, really to actually world over wherever manufacturing has taken place is the defense sector which has driven innovation and growth in manufacturing. The internet, everything has emerged from the defense manufacturing and to my mind, uh, in the defense sector, we need to unleash many more make program. You have done only two make programs which are uh, substantially delayed, so you need to unleash many more, about 30, 35. And I think uh, your integrated defense headquarters should, taking it out of the, uh, your long-term perspective plan should say, these are what we want to manufacture in India, have integrated project teams which will hold these projects, uh, work with these projects through the lifetime of these uh, projects. 
Secondly, I think we need to strengthen uh, the cost audit systems. You know, in America, for instance, defense manufacturing drove it. We need to break away from this monopoly of the PSUs and need to look at private sector companies and say these are our national champions. So, if you look at America, the Lockheeds of the world, uh, the, uh, all the top defense manufacturers were treated as national champions. And what the American government did was that they did put a cost audit team in there in the private sector and they did cost audit and they said this is your cost of manufacturing plus 16 percent and they paid them that and that's how the national champions emerged. So I personally feel that defense manufacturing will take off if we do about a hundred, hundred and fifty make programs and if we identify about fifty to sixty Indian companies as national champions who will drive defense manufacturing. Thank you. Okay, okay. We've got to, we've got to wrap up now. Uh, we want to thank uh, one of our sponsors, uh, Yes Bank, for helping us set up this event. And uh, I'd like to call on now Nikhil Sani, Senior Re President, Government Relations, to wrap up this evening. Uh, thanks so much, Mr. Miranda, Mr. Amitabh Kant, uh, you know, uh, Bharat, Aditi, members of Yes Bank's board, dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, always an honor and privilege to uh, be a participant in an event uh, where Mr. Khan speaks. His passion and energy, as someone was just mentioning, is is actually something which is running the show, largely. Make in India is largely something that the Prime Minister had, you know, kind of launched, and it is being executed by Mr. Khan. Uh, for many of you, or maybe some of you who don't know in this room, uh, Incredible India is also something that he had pioneered. So when it comes to India, you know, Mr. Khan is the perfect person to take care of it. You know, obviously a lot of uh, the budget this time around was very, very, you know, again, directionally uh, towards incentives for Make in India. Earlier today in the day, uh, I read in the newspapers that the Reserve Bank of India has actually said that it will include medium enterprises, MSMEs, which will be actually the drivers, growth drivers of Make in India. Uh, certain amount of lending, as Mr. Kant was mentioning about them being over leveraged, well, uh, they will be included under the priority sector guidelines. So that is one welcome step from the government. Obviously, you know, um, a lot of anxious people in this room, everyone wants to see India become a superpower, uh, takes time. But yes, I think directionally we are, we are going ahead, I think, uh, where we should be. Um, well, we partnered with International Innovation Corps. Uh, to be very honest, at a certain point in time, Anu Panani and David Cashman from University of Chicago visited uh, Rana Kapoor, our MD and CEO, and offered us to you know, partner a project in DMIC, which was that point in time definitely being led by Mr. Kant. Uh, we jumped at the opportunity. We wanted to get associated with it. And ever since he's moved uh, as Secretary DIPP, he's again lent his support. Uh, so great. Uh, thankful to the University of Chicago, you know, uh, for, you know, kind of getting in five fellows who are, you know, kind of working passionately towards this project. Uh, one suggestion, actually, because we are talking so much Make in India, uh, the University of Chicago has, uh, is actually supposed to be the best school for executive education in the world. Now, I came across a website of a premier business school, uh, an international premier business school, which had, which is rather creating a program for multinational corporates to come and enter the Indian market. I saw this and the brief was very, very interesting, something that Mr. Kant also mentioned. Complicated market, great opportunity, you cannot afford to ignore India. Come 2050, this is going to be too big. So if you miss the bus today, you will miss it forever. So, because if, if one school can create this, you know, making it is all about creating a lot of you know, information across the world about what India is all about. And I think the University of Chicago can take a lead as, you know, the best executive education uh, school in the world to, you know, kind of put up such programs which will uh, enable in making in India and make India, you know, a destination for all MNCs. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Miranda. It was uh, indeed a pleasure. And I, I hope a lot of questions that we will have been answered. For those which haven't been, I think Bharat has arranged more snacks. So you will possibly have an opportunity to ask your questions over snacks. Thank you.